we've been saying that all summer long, right? And, and most of us say, oh, I'm never afraid, right? There's times I'm afraid. Sometimes it's driving down the 18. <laughs> With someone else driving. <laughs> I will not be afraid. The theme verse that we've had throughout this is Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verse 9. If you want to go ahead and click that, please, Jonathan. The very next slide, please. It says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. So that even if I am afraid, and we can be afraid of all kinds of things, right? Let's face it, and we've been saying this throughout this series, our government had to scare us. Do, do any of you remember the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic? The early days, like back in March, okay? In early March, when we're hearing about it coming from China, and different reports are coming out, like, right? Like, okay, it's not passed from person to person, so you don't have anything to be afraid of. You remember that? Yeah, I know the politicians don't want us to remember some of this, right? But, but, then, but then it was like, we are about to have so many people on respirators dying. The hospitals are going to be overwhelmed. And in order to keep us from having everybody dying at the same time, because everybody's going to get this, in order to keep us from dying all at the same time, in order to keep this overwhelming surge in the hospitals, we're going to shut everything down for three, for, what was it, initially two weeks, right? And then I remember Trump saying, and President Trump, excuse me, I remember him saying, and, and, and it may be that we have to go all the way to Easter. So that was like three weeks. And for the first time in history that I can imagine, Easter went with most churches not worshiping. Many of the small churches hadn't gotten online yet, hadn't gotten their, their streaming uh, ready yet. Um, we were one of those few churches up here on the mountain who actually met in the parking lot at Lake Gregory and had an outdoor, there were over 50 some cars that were there from the community that joined us for an Easter celebration of worship right there in the parking lot, excuse me. But do you remember that back then? It was supposed to get over at least soon, wasn't it? I think this is now August 16th, isn't it? <laughs> and life continues to be traumatic for many people. Now, the sad thing is, is that yes, people are still dying. People are still getting COVID-19. Getting sick with it. Wes, actually, who had other issues, right? Had his own colon cancer, which was killing him. And then once he got COVID, then that's what will be listed as the way he actually died. And there's a lot of fear. Now, some of you are afraid that Trump will get reelected. <laughs> some of you are afraid he won't. Some of you are just afraid. Some of you are afraid to say anything like, okay, well, do black lives matter? Or do all lives matter? Or only some black lives? You're afraid even know what, what to say. And you just, you know, the, the best thing, just be quiet. And there is a lot of fear that is really spread all throughout our globe. Not just here in this little community, but around the world. So much so that people get so angry if you don't have your mask on that, that now people have gotten into fights because someone didn't have their mask on. Joe Biden says, as soon as you walk out, everybody, everybody in the world needs to wear a mask at all times. I get bad breath, that's not nice. <laughs> there are things that we're doing to try to protect other people, which is being loving and caring, but there is so much misinformation and mistruth and so much question, and what is it all meant to do? It causes fear. And the greatest cause of fear is not a politician. I know some of you might be really ticked off at some of them, but it's not a politician. The greatest cause for fear is the one who is the spirit of fear. Yeah. The spirit of darkness. The spirit of the Antichrist. Who wants us to believe that God is no longer in control. That man is. 
that the world is under human governance rather than the divine. Let us not, as people of God, give in to that fear. In fact, today's message is, fear of God gives me hope. Throughout the Psalms, there are some almost a hundred different places in the Old Testament where it says, fear God, fear God, fear God. And yet, most of us kind of get uncomfortable with that thought. Fear God, we're not supposed to fear God, we're supposed to love God, right? Enjoy Him, He's a wonderful friend. And in fact, John 15, he's, he's called us friends, and so we no longer need to be afraid of Him, right? And yet there's still something about fear that we need to hold on to. Because to fear God is to revere Him. It's to be in awe of Him. It's to respect Him. Now, I understand that the Hebrew word, as well as the, the Greek word phobos, both of the terms uh, in, in Hebrew and in Greek include this mixture of terms. The fear you have if a, if a car is rushing at you and you've got to jump out of the way before you get run over. That fear. And the, and the respect, the awe that you have. When you look at a raging fire, and you understand you have no ability to control these fires that are on these mountains right now. And the respect you have for God. The fear of God gives me hope. Psalm 33. We're going to go through this psalm today. Verses 1 through 3 say this. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to Him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. And the psalmist is telling us it's time to praise the Lord. Take note. Praising the Lord doesn't mean that you're feeling happy. In fact, praising the Lord may be the very thing that will give you joy. And the thing that you might be missing joy because you're not praising the Lord. It's one of the reasons why we're here today, why those doors are open, why we believe people got to be worshiping. And there's a worship that takes place when people are together that doesn't happen when people are online. And I think there's wonderful things that are happening online. And the, and the group meetings, the, the social meetings that are happening, uh, Bible studies and small groups, we have them. All those things are wonderful. And to be able to do that with Zoom or Google Meets or whatever, i, I got to be careful who I'm advertising, but whatever, whatever tool that you use, to be able to do that is wonderful. But we need to be doing more than that. God's people need to be praising Him together in one voice. And notice this. It says, when it says, sing to Him a new song. Well, we just did that this morning, Virgie. And the week before, too, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> okay. And play skillfully. See, this one's all on you. Okay, got okay. it. All on you, sorry. And shout for joy. And to praise the Lord sometimes really involves a shouting. It, there's got to be something, some energy behind it, some enthusiasm, some, some sense of, God, you're worthy of praise. Folks, people are shouting for all kinds of other things. Shouldn't we once in a while shout for Jesus? Yes. Amen. Yes. 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 A.W. Tozer wrote, What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you because it affects everything else in your life. He goes on, he says, for this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. And the most portentous fact about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian, but of the company of Christians that composes the church. Did you have an image this morning when we started to sing How Great Thou Art? 
For some of you, that's been such a lifelong uh, song that's touched deep parts of your soul. Was there some image that started to come to your mind? Uh, Tozer is saying, that's, that image is there, and it's there sometimes collectively. Always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God. Just as her most significant message is what she says about him, or what she leaves unsaid. For her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. And Tozer's talking about the church and what we say or what we're silent about. So this morning, the psalmist invites us, let's rejoice. Let's praise God. And folks, I got I to just tell you right now, I know you're not praising him enough. We have more praise to give to God, our Creator, God, our Father, God, our Savior, God, our friend, God, our Lord. We have so much more praise that He deserves, so much more than we are already giving Him, that somebody needs to pinch themselves and say, praise the Lord, because we've got more to give. Okay, no one did it. Praise the Lord. Thank you. <laughs> The psalmist continues, and, and, and in this he says, you can trust the Lord. This is why we can praise him, because he's worthy of trust. He's dependable. You can count on him doing what he says he's going to do. Psalm 33, verse 4 to 7 says this, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. <laughs> Don't you love it when the Old Testament starts to use word for a person? Do you see it there? For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The living word of God, Jesus Christ, is faithful in all he does. And he's coming out right here in the psalmist. Verse 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Boy, I don't know about you, but... I watched some of these riots and some of the protests and even some of the news stations and I'm like, where's the love? And yet, notice what, what the psalmist says. The world is full of his unfailing love. That means God doesn't stop loving regardless of what's going on around him. By the word of the Lord, verse 6, the Lord, the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. We look at submarine shots and pictures of going deep into the ocean and some of the dark places and the unusual uh, life that is down there. And, and God can reach down in there and he pulls the water into storehouses. Or he puts the stars in the space. And any of you see the, the pictures just this last week of that new solar system out there that they believe is going dead? There's a star that they actually can see. There's a spot on it and it's getting really bright and they're, they're believing that the star is going to go out. In other words, it's going to explode. By the way, that already happens light years ago, but yeah. we'll get to see it right <laughs> later. <laughs> and God has put those stars all out there. You see, folks, we can trust the Lord because He keeps His word. He makes a promise. Uh, what Second Corinthians says, all of the promises of God are what? Yes, in Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ has met all the promises that God has made for us. And the earth, it's full of his unfailing love. So this week, I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to look around for the evidence of God's love. Be careful where you're looking. <laughs> Be careful how much news you're listening to. Be careful what blog you turn on. But look around for evidence of God's unfailing love. <clears throat> Because what the psalmist says is there's evidence of his unfailing love in the mountains. There's evidence of his unfailing love in the heavens. There's evidence of his unfailing love in the stars. There's evidence of his unfailing love in the ocean and the waves that keep coming. There's evidence all around us of his unfailing love. I appreciate what the psalmist says, similar to this in Psalm 104, when he says this, Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord my God, 
You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariots and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the watery depths as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. God is visible in his creation. Look for him this week. And now we move into the heart of the psalm. It's really the key theme and the key verse in this psalm for us. And it's verses 8 and 9. And this is where we're instructed once again. Fear the Lord. And by the way, may I simply remind you that this is a command, not an invitation. This is an instruction that God is giving to us. Fear the Lord. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Now take note, is it interesting that right there, in the midst of this verse 8, the psalmist is helping us to understand when he's talking about fear, he's talking about reverence. He's talking about having this deep respect for God. And then he explains why. He says, because God spoke and life came into existence. God spoke and he commanded and the world and all of life stood firm. In the Nelson's study Bible, it says, the fear of God is an attitude of respect, a response of reverence and wonder. It is the only appropriate response to our creator and redeemer. What if our men are going through Proverbs, right, Jeff, on Saturday mornings, and we've uh, learned this one right early on, Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That verse is quoted again in Psalm 111 when it says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. C.S. Lewis, in response to Tozer's comments, says this, How God thinks of us is not only more important than what we think of him, but infinitely more important. Indeed, how we think of him is of no importance except insofar as it is related to how he thinks of us. It is written that we shall stand before him, shall appear, shall be inspected. The promise of glory is the promise almost incredible and only possible by the work of Christ that some of us, that any of us who really chooses shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. You see, to please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father in a son, it seems impossible. A weight or burden of glory, which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but it is so. And what, what Lewis is trying to help us to understand is just that what God thinks of us depends totally on what Jesus did for us. Because we will all someday, all humanity, every person will someday stand in front of the judgment seat of God. And sadly, in our world where we want to make everything politically correct, we're not supposed to say that some will be judged to heaven and some will be judged to hell. In fact, in today's theology, all 
if you do heed good, and you will make it to heaven. By the way, you tell me what that measurement, the line of good is. At what point are you good and what point are you bad? Because what it, it appears is that our modern day theology is good is based on whatever you think good is. So if you think you were good, then you'll make it into heaven. Now if you think you were bad, you might be in trouble. And yet, one day, all people will stand before God and be judged by Him. Maybe we should fear God. Maybe we should respect Him so much that we care about our actions, our behavior, our faith, our belief. In, um, there's an online tool called Got Questions where you can uh, write in questions or you can read all the different questions that are on. There's a whole bunch of questions that they try to respond to. And in a recent uh, Got Questions article it said, believers are not to be scared of God. We have no reason to be scared of Him. We have His promise that nothing can separate us from His love. True? Romans 8, 38 and 39. We have His promise that He will never leave us or forsake us. Hebrews 13, 5. Fearing God God means having such a reverence for Him that it has a great impact on the way we live our lives. The fear of God is respecting Him. So you see, when you respect God, you obey Him. You do what He says. You, you really, you, you honor Him. You want to honor Him. You want to do His will because you respect and awe Him. You fear Him. He goes on, fearing God is good because it saves us from caving into our own sinful nature. That's why hearing someone is God-fearing actually makes us trust that person more. This is Rick Warren now. He says, if they fear God, they are more likely to keep their word and treat others with kindness. In fact, Romans 3, a classic chapter on sin, says that our chief sin is this. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Take a look at that verse, Romans 3, verse 18. It's a quotation from Psalm 36. For the director of music of David, a servant of the Lord, I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I don't know about you, but I, as I've watched the looting that, that seems to keep taking place, um, last week in Chicago and, and the New York and Seattle and Portland, but as the looters go in, have you noticed they're like not afraid of the police? I don't know about you, but I drive down the road and if I saw red lights behind me, my heart starts to race, my blood pressure goes up, and I start looking around and, oh no, what did I just do? Okay? And there's a fear there. In fact, I got my very first ticket driving at 16. I had my car for two weeks and my driver's license for two weeks. And five of us were in the car and we were going to a youth, a Christian youth event down in Downey. And we're coming back from that event on the 605, switching over to, to, to San Bernardino 10. You know the interchange there? Okay, I'm talking about years ago, 40 some years ago, right? No, 60, 50 some years ago. Oh, it's, it's, a yeah. it's a long time ago, okay? So, but I'm getting on, oh God, I forgot to tell you this. The left turn signal on the car doesn't work. <laughs> So I'm trying to get on to the Interstate 10. One of the guys in the back, one of our, one of our friends, is playing a guitar. Okay, we're Christian kids, going to a Christian event, coming back from a Christian event. I get pulled over by a highway patrolman. As the highway patrolman turns his lights on me, oh no, I start to move over. Oh no, there's a car there, it's doing that. Okay, let the car get by. Then I move over and I finally get off the side. He writes me up a ticket for reckless change of lanes. <laughs> <laughs> you scared the bejeebies out of me. What do you expect me to do? To, to see, and, and what amazes me is just that these people looting have no fear. 
I was watching as police, there were like eight police officers walked up in front of this one store. They're, they're literally marching up to the store and the kids are coming out, climbing over the police to get away with their stuff in their hands. Yeah. And they did, were not afraid. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And how much is that in our world? And sadly, sometimes even the church. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Maybe to help you to think of this in a slightly different way. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Let's get rid of the garbage in our lives, whatever it is. Let's get rid of the sin that's in our lives, whatever that is. Why? Because of our reverence for God. And may I warn you, God's watching. That's good news and bad news. We go on in Psalm 33, verse 10. It says, The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. God's watching everything we do. God's got his plans for this world and he's accomplishing them and he's watching all the plans that we're making and he kind of sits up there and laughs sometimes, doesn't he? <laughs> what plans are you making? <laughs> you got it all figured out, right? <laughs> and God said, my plans and I'm watching what you're doing. And by the way, depending on your behavior when God's watching, you might want to be a little bit more afraid. For the person who's sitting there watching porn, you might want to be afraid when God's watching. For the person who's sitting there gossiping to somebody else or ridiculing somebody else or tearing down somebody else, you might want to be afraid because God is watching. So whatever you're doing, are you doing what you want God to see you doing? The psalmist goes on. And this is where I got the section of fit. My fear of God gives me hope. Verse 16. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escaped by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. I fear God because when I sin, it's harmful. And I'm hurting the God I should respect. I mentioned earlier the way so many of these looters are treating the police officers. And that's troubling. Especially the white people standing in front of a black police officer throwing F-bombs and other statements at them, calling them racist and horrible other things, and then swearing, holding the sign saying Black Lives Matter. <laughs> There's something wrong with that picture. Awesome. Incidentally, it's not just black parents who have to have the conversation with their kids. I'm sure that if you had kids driving a vehicle, you warn them that if a car, car officer pulls you over, show some respect. If you have to go to court, dress up nice, okay? show respect. 
You, you teach that very same thing that all parents should be teaching. Respect authority. <clears throat> so why are so many people hollering at the police? 1 John 4, 17 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And now he's talking about fearing things other than God. May I conclude with this question? Is your hope in Jesus? Do you live like your hope is in Jesus? Could a neighbor who doesn't know Jesus look at you and say, they've got hope I don't have. Is your hope in Jesus? The psalmist concludes this way. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in You. What did the last verse of, or verse, I should say, verse 6 of Psalm 23 say? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David's hope was in the Lord. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. May the words of the psalmist, the words of this book, God's book, may they encourage you and give you hope today. Oh yes, next week we're going to talk about the anger of God and forgiveness. And may we respect and awe Him. God, you are good to us way beyond anything we deserve. That's what grace is. A gift that you give that's not deserved by any of us. All of us have sinned and fallen short of your glory. All of us still do things that, that show a lack of respect for who you are. All of us fail. And yet, you are gracious and good to us. Jesus. Lord, I pray that every one of us listening and watching will renew our commitment. Our commitment to put our hope in you. Our commitment to respect and honor you above all else. In Jesus' name. Amen.